And the title of the message this morning is A Journey Begun. And we saw last time the, uh, the preparation um, through this King Cyrus to send the Jewish people back to their homeland and back to Jerusalem. And we'll find out later on here that Zerubbabel uh, would become the leader of those who were going back for the purpose of building the temple. He would be followed by Ezra, who would uh, really build the people and instruct the people in the laws of God. And then later on, uh, Nehemiah would come back uh, to build the walls in Jerusalem. So I want us to look here. Uh, let's just read verse 1 to verse 3. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him the house at Jerusalem, and house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Now, we saw already that God had placed this in Cyrus's heart. And it's interesting in the book of Isaiah, uh, long before uh, Cyrus was born, that uh, God uh, named him and described how that he would be his vassal, his servant, to bring his people back uh, to the land after the 70 years of captivity. And so, <clears throat> I'll just, if you just look at your notes there, uh, what we see here in verse 3 is he's challenging. So God it's, it originates in the heart of God. And he places it in the heart of Cyrus. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it whithersoever he will. And so then Cyrus then is really provoking the Jewish people and inviting them, challenging them uh, to go back to the land, uh, back to Jerusalem. And in verse 3 he says, Who is there among you of all his people? So it's really open to anybody that really wanted to do it. So this was going to be a very important journey. Uh, that is beginning right here, a journey back from Persia now, uh, Babylon, media Persia, uh, back to Jerusalem. And we've said in our notes, a journey of a thousand miles begins with just one step. You know, it doesn't matter how, how long the journey is, it has to start somewhere. And this is going to be a series of journeys that will go back to Jerusalem. And this is where it starts. And it starts with the first step. And somebody has to take the first step. Uh, I remember... Uh, when I got saved, and just about two months after I got saved, there was a, a service when, and there's some of us young people were thinking about going to Bible college and so on. And I remember uh, taking that first step out from my seat in the little Boy Scout Hall in Crimea in Belfast. And really little did I know, and I didn't know. I, I kind of could have maybe guessed that uh, that first step was going to take me a long way, and it did because when I stepped out from my seat and walked down the aisle and the pastor says, well, why have you come? I says, and give my life to the Lord to serve him. And well, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to go to Bible school. He says, when are you going to go? I says, well, when does it start? And um, for, you know, two months after that, I was at Tennessee Temple. I was only saved four months when I arrived at Tennessee Temple. Didn't know hardly anything. Uh, but that was the first step in a very, very long journey. And you know, you and I can take a step even today. Right now, today, you could take a step that will lead your life in a direction that takes you a long way. But the a journey of a thousand miles starts with just one step. And you don't know where it's going to take you. These people, when they were challenged by Cyrus, did not know where that journey was going to take them. And it's kind of like Abraham. He went out not knowing whether he went. And, you know, some people want to have all the answers and all the, all the details before, you know, up front. And then maybe they'll agree to it. And that's not the way the Lord operates. The Lord doesn't give you the whole, the whole plan, like Tom, uh, <clears throat> you know, back in 1979, this is what I'm going to do with your life, and uh, is that okay with you? And then when I give it the okay, then I step out. God doesn't operate like that. The Lord just says, come on. And you don't know where it's going to take you. But that's part of the adventure, and that's part of uh, walking by, by faith. And so the secret to success in life is to find God's will and to do it. And so it all begins with God. It was God that initiated this journey and this return to the land uh, and the opportunity that he created for the Jewish people uh, to return. So in verse uh, 3 here, we see, first of all, willing volunteers. 
By the way, if the people had not went back, think of that. I mean, if the, if the people hadn't went back and rebuilt the temple, that temple later on, Herod the Great would come and take over the project. And I, I forget, I should have looked that up, but it's, it's before, it was still BC, it was before Jesus was born that Herod um, began the, the, the project of, of building the temple. And uh, but if they hadn't went back, there wouldn't have been a temple to to improve upon. And if they hadn't been back in the land, then what you know could Jesus have been born in Bethlehem and raised? In that? All of God's program was dependent upon these things, these people going back. So it's really important that they did. But they were willing volunteers. He says, "Who is there among you of all uh, his people? His God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem." which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. So Scaris calls for Jewish volunteers who are willing to go back to rebuild the temple. Now here's the point. Not, not everybody was willing. Now we don't know how many uh, Jews were in captivity, but it would certainly, it probably was in the millions. It would certainly would have been the hundreds of thousands. Uh, but, but less than 50,000 returned. And so not everybody was willing to go. Most of the Jewish people stayed in Babylon, Persia. Many had settled down in the captivity and were content. You know, the Bible talks about being at ease in Zion. That's really human nature. You know, we, we nest, we get a place. And although it might be um, maybe difficult at first and uh, a lot of questions and decisions, but once we kind of, it's like water find its own level and we kind of get to a place where we're comfortable, we nest in there, and then it's really hard to budge you. You know, it's hard to move once you find that little sweet spot. And somebody comes along to challenge you to leave that and go out. Um, well, there's a lot of people who weren't willing to do that. And so we find that when um, you get this in chapter 2 and verse 64, where it, it counts the people, the whole congregation together was 42,303 score. We'll talk about that down under point number 5. Uh, all together, there were servants added to that total and singers before 49,697 people. So under 50,000 people uh, returned under uh, Zerubbabel at the request of Cyrus. And think about this. Most of these people had actually never been to Jerusalem. You know, they've been gone for 70 years. And so <clears throat> most of these people here going back would have been born in Babylon. They'd never even been to Israel, never been to Jerusalem, didn't know what it looked like. And now they were going to have to leave everything that they knew and uh, go back to this this place, and of course it wasn't easy. There was, as you'll see when we get, especially the book of Nehemiah, and even here in Ezra, that there were enemies in the land. Um, and there was a lot of risk there. Um, again, you know, my own story was that when I decided to do, made that decision, and the next thing, my aunt was was on my case, man. She was, and of course, uh, her son was one of the ones that uh, volunteered as well. Uh, my cousin Samuel, and so she invited me home for lunch one Sunday afternoon. And soon, soon as lunch was over, and she sat the two of us on the couch, and the finger came out and read us the, the Rad Act. And she said to me, "You're you've, you're you're only saved a few." And you know, I can kind of understand where she's coming from. You know, she says you've only been saved a few weeks, and you're throwing up your job and quitting your apprenticeship, and you're going, you're going to get on a plane, go to America. She says, "What happens if you get over there and you don't like it?" And I I thought. You know, I never even actually thought about that because that wasn't really an issue for me. It doesn't matter if I liked it or not. It was something I was constrained to do. Uh, but there's risk there. And, um, you know, you never, you never know what it's like to walk on water until, first of all, you're willing to get out of the boat. If you're not willing to get out of the boat, you're not going to experience what it is to walk on water. Peter walked on the water because he was the only one that was willing to throw his leg over the side and, and to check it out. Well, there's risk there. Well, what happens? Well, you know, life's full of risks. But really, you know, when, when the Bible says, they that honor me, I will honor. And there, there's, there's a, you know, a principle through Scripture where God is looking for faith. Jesus said, I've not found so great faith in Israel. And really it was the Gentiles, uh, the Roman centurion, the Syrophoenician woman, uh, where he said, this is, this is great faith. He was amazed at their faith. God loves faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And so here were those who had never been to Jerusalem. We're going to leave everything that they knew to go to a place that they'd never been to before, where they realized it might not be easy. They knew it was not going to be easy. They knew there's all kinds of, of possibilities of loss. 
maybe even lose their own lives, but lose property and uh, be in a position where they're under maybe persecution, where where they were in Persia at that time, it would have been really easy. And many of them were not willing to go, but some of them were, 50,000 of them were, were willing to go and to risk that. And so there was willing volunteers, and I thank God that they were willing to do that because we wouldn't have had, you know, Jerusalem and Israel and a place for Jesus to come, for the Messiah to come to. So thank God for those who are willing to step out by faith. That is really important. And it does involve risk, doesn't it? But it's not really any risk when, it's, when, when the Lord is in it. And the Lord was certainly in this. The second thing here is teamwork. If you look at verse 4, And whosoever remaineth, Cyrus is still speaking, he's challenged now those who are willing to go to go, and God be with him. And verse 4, And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the free will, free will offering of the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Okay, so some may not have been able to return, maybe because of age, uh, maybe because of weakness. And some of them uh, were old that did go back because you'll find out later on that they could still remember as, as children seeing the great the temple of Solomon before it was destroyed. And then when they come back into the land under Zerubbabel and they laid the foundations and those people wept, Uh, The young people uh, shouted for joy because here it was, the temple was being rebuilt. But the old people remembered the glory of Solomon's temple, that it wasn't anything like this new one. It it was just a shadow, really, of what what Solomon had done. Uh, So there were some older folks there, but maybe because of age and weakness, some did not return. Uh, Daniel did not return. If you look here at Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, now in the first year of Cyrus, and if you go over to Daniel... Uh, chapter 10, you'll find in the third year of Cyrus, verse 1, Daniel 10, in the third year of Cyrus, now Daniel was taken probably as a 15-year-old, something like that, uh, and probably the first wave, there was three waves out, three waves back, but the first wave out when Nebuchadnezzar came to take uh, the, really the cream of the crop, and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have been the cream of the crop. And so, um, and here you are, 70 years later. So Daniel's like 85 here. You know, Daniel's like really up in age. And so in verse 1, he says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So uh, Zerubbabel and that crowd, they've been already back in the land for uh, at least two years when Daniel wrote this. And in verse 4, in the 4 and 20th day of the first month, uh, as I was by the side of the great river, which is uh, Hiddekel, which is actually the river Tigris. Uh, Tigris, Euphrates. So Daniel's still there. Daniel didn't go back. He died there in Babylon. So the point is, some couldn't go back, uh, but those who didn't go back were challenged to supply and help the ones that did go back. And so Cyrus is basically instructing them. He says, you people that are staying here, uh, let the men of his place help him, the one that's going back to Jerusalem. He needs help, and you people who are staying here, staying by the stuff, you need to help them and provide for them silver and gold and beasts and beside the free will offering for the house. In other words, the people that stayed, there was a whip room, there was a, there was a free will offering that the people in Persia, the Jewish people in Persia, were to take up, to gather together, to take with them uh, back to Jerusalem. So the funds were provided to build the temple, even from those that, that didn't go back. Now, the ones that did go back, some of them, uh, gave a, a free will offering as well. But what we see here is teamwork. You know, so some people went back and other people stayed and they provided for the ones that did go back. Kind of reminds you of missionary support. You know, there's some people, missionaries that go to the field and maybe you can't go or and it's not your God's will for you to go, but it's 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 we're all to be involved in that missionary project. And so some of us go and some of us give that others might go. And so it's a teamwork. And we see that here with God's people. Uh, that they were all involved um, with getting this work uh, done. In other words, we all have a place to fill. See, um, there's different, there's a variety of different ministries, a variety of different places for us to fill in the body of Christ. Some people are ears, some people are hands, some people are noses, some people are eyes, some people are feet. Uh, but we're all part of the body, and if we all do our part, then the whole body works together. And so here, everybody did his bit. Then in verse 5, we see a single purpose. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised up 
or, or had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And I think it's interesting this point that there's, he doesn't say, now Zerubbabel, you're, you're, the, chief, you're the chief man, uh, you're to lead these people out. There's no leaders that are mentioned here. This was basically an invitation from Cyrus that anybody that was willing, anybody and everybody you want to go, let's do it. Your God be with you and uh, your people help you and provide for you as you go. Um, and so the single purpose that we find here, though, um, is given that they would build the house of the Lord. But think about that. Uh, when you go over to chapter 2, verse 2 is where Zerubbabel is first mentioned. It says, which came with Zerubbabel, uh, Joshua, Nehemiah, um, Saria, uh, Rila, uh, uh, Re, Riel, Ai, ah. <laughs> Mordecai, uh, and by the way, Nehemiah and Mordecai are not the Nehemiah of the next book, ne Nehemiah, and Mordecai is not the Mordecai of Esther, okay, because they were still in the land at this point, um, but it's kind of like, you know, there's more than, you know, there's more than one person has the same name, okay. Uh, but anyway, Zerubbabel was first mentioned there. And then also, if you go over to uh, uh, verse 63 of chapter 2, it says, And the Tirshatha, in Gaelic, uh, the, the prime minister of Aaron is called the Tishak. The Tishak. They don't say prime minister, they say Tishak, because it's a Gaelic word. It's kind of funny here, because that's what that means here. It means the governor, the prime minister. The Tirshatha uh, said unto them, and if you look down... Uh, let's see, chapter 3, verse 2. Then stood up uh, Jeshurun, the son of uh, Josedach, uh, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of uh, Shealtiel, and his brethren, and built at the altar of the God of Israel. Uh, down in verse uh, number 8 uh, of chapter 3. Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel. Uh, and so now it's kind of like when you're reading through this, at first there's no leaders. It's basically the people are going back on group. And then all of a sudden you see these different men starting to pop up. And then one of those men, Zerubbabel, really becomes the leader of the whole thing, that he becomes the governor in Jerusalem, um, supported by uh, Cyrus and the government, who still controlled all of that area uh, from Persia. Now that's interesting because sometimes we think that leaders are born. He's a born leader, and some leaders are born. Uh, I have several friends that that's they were born that way. Their natural talent, their natural abilities, their natural skill set. It's like they've always had those attributes all through their life. They're natural born leaders, but not all leaders are natural born. Some some leaders are made. Um, uh, look over at First Corinthians chapter eleven. Have you ever heard the phrase "cometh the R"? Cometh the man. Or is that that's just maybe that's a British saying, I don't know. Uh, but what it means is when there's a when there's a crisis time, whether it's in the country in politics or whatever, when there or maybe in a war, when there's a crisis, when the hour comes of great need, uh, before that time it's like you're looking around you, and then all of a sudden there's a man comes. Cometh the hour, cometh the man. Back in the nineteen forties in, in Great Britain there was a great, great need. The hour had come. Uh, when Britain was under attack. And before that period of time, there was a man by the name of Winston Churchill who was a failure as a politician, complete failure. Um, but when he became prime minister during the wartime, he was the man for the hour. I mean, he led uh, Great Britain during those days when, when the very dark hours, he says, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the streets, we'll fight them on the, on the land. We'll fight them in the air, fight them everywhere. Uh, everybody, you know, the, all of Europe had capitulated. Everybody had surrendered. And he says, we're not going to surrender. And a, a, a weaker leader would not have been able to do what he did. And it's just amazing that God, I guess, brought him for that particular time. And then after the war was over, he lost the election and really was never a leader after that either. So he was just there for that period of time. But, um, but it was a very important period of time. Uh, when you look here at 1 Corinthians 11, it's an interesting little verse, verse 19. It says, for there must, <clears throat> well, let's look at verse 18. He says, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. You'll see tonight from 1 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul was always hearing stuff from the churches, you know. Uh, there, the, uh, news would come to his ears, and he says, I hear that there's divisions among you, and I partly believe it. 
Then in verse 19, he says, For there must also be heresies among you. And heresies has to do with divisions and schisms. Then it says that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. That's an interesting verse. What does it mean? It means basically that when there's, when there's crisis, even within the church, it's almost like it's a testing ground for true leaders to kind of rise to the top. Uh, in those particular situations, uh, they which are approved may be manifest, revealed among you. And sometimes when there's, when there's crisis times, whether it's uh, in the country or in the church or whatever, um, you'll see people who will rise to the top. Uh, leaders sometimes are made, not born. Okay? And uh, which is very, very interesting. Maybe you may, you may not consider yourself to be a born leader, but it may be that God will use you in a leadership capacity. That's, it's uh, something that, that God will put on you and give you the ability to, to do. But all these people had been raised up and stirred up by God. So it wasn't just Zerubbabel. It was really all the people at this point. And God had put it in their hearts to build the house of the Lord. So the cause was already there in their hearts. And their purpose was to rebuild God's house of Jerusalem. Now, they weren't going back to build their villages, their, their, uh, the walls of Jerusalem. That would happen later on. But their, their purpose initially was the house of God. And that's what he says in verse 5. With all them whose spirit God had raised, God had put it in their hearts to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Why do you think that was important? And what was what was it was in their heart anyway? Was it a selfish thing? It wasn't that they were going back to, to you know to rework their own farms again, although ultimately that would happen. And it wasn't it wasn't the, the glory of Jerusalem that they were mostly concerned about. It was the glory of God and God's house. It was God's house, first of all. And that's where their heart, and their heart was in the right place. So their single purpose was uh, to build the house of God. And really, there's, there was no greater purpose than that. Uh, and all of us, obviously, have our own responsibilities. But the work of God should be really paramount in, in our lives. And that really should take the priority. Number four, then, an opportunity to right a wrong. In verse number seven, we didn't read verse six. Verse six goes back up to teamwork and all they that were about them strengthen their hands with vessels of silver with go- with gold with goods with beasts with precious things beside all all that was willingly offered so these people were going back with stuff uh provided uh, for them verse 7 also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the lord which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem and had put them in the house of his gods even those that Cyrus king of Persia bring forth by the hand of Mithridath the treasurer and numbered them unto Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, 30 charges of gold, a thousand charges of silver, nine and twenty knives, 30 basins of gold, silver basins of a second sort, 410, and other vessels a thousand. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 500, uh, sorry, 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up uh, with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon onto Jerusalem. So Nebuchadnezzar, as we know, when he went into Jerusalem, into the temple, uh, Solomon, in his wisdom, had provided, I mean, you know, I mean, silver wasn't even counted. Uh, there was so much of everything uh, in Solomon's reign, and they, uh, and the wisdom that Solomon had, uh, when he built the temple and all the vessels of the temple, I mean, it was something to behold. Uh, when the queen of Sheba came, she said, the half has not been told me. She says, blessed be your servants who stand here and listen to what you have to say. So you can imagine that the vessels that, that, they, that Nebuchadnezzar sacked out of the temple was, was really substantial. And really have 5,400 gold and silver vessels that Cyrus was saying, send it back. That's an amazing thing when you think about Cyrus uh, and what was in his heart. Um, and so Nebuchadnezzar had caused God's house to be defiled and destroyed. And the name of the Lord and the Lord's people had been humiliated, although God did leave Himself, did not leave Himself without witness. If you go to Daniel, you see this was important. Uh, in Daniel five, you remember Daniel five, the five, the handwriting on the wall, um, with Belshazzar, the last king of Babylon. If you look down at verse twenty-two and twenty-three, this is when Daniel is preaching against this guy. This was the night of his death. 
because Darius the Mede was going to come in and, and uh, conquer Babylon this very night. Verse 22, And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. Daniel's preaching to Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, and he reminds ne- uh, Belshazzar that his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, God humbled him, and he lost his mind for seven years and ran around on all fours like a wild beast, and his hair growing out and claws, nails growing in the claws. And his grandson knew that. He knew that it was the judgment of God and that he didn't fear God. Some people have to learn it the hard way. And he says, you, have, you, knew, you, you knew all this, verse 23, but, the, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have, now watch, they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives. Why, did they not have their own vessels? Of course they did. What, were they, what was Belshazzar doing? He was making a point. He was thumbing his nose at the God of, of, the God of Israel. And he was bringing the vessels, these holy vessels from the temple, into their drunken orgy and filling them with wine, as he goes on to say. Um, they, they, they lords, thy wives, thy concubines, and have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and brass and iron and wood and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways thou hast not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and the writing was written. And basically send your, your numbers up, and uh, tonight you're going to die. And so, uh, again, God gives people enough rope, and they, this man took advantage of that, and he was desecrating these holy vessels of the Lord, and the Lord didn't leave himself without witness. There was a judgment that came that very night because of that. But here we have, back in Ezra chapter 1, a, an opportunity to right this wrong. Cyrus is volunteering all of these vessels to go back. They must have had a wagon or something. But, you know, to put, could you imagine all the thousands and thousands, you know, 5,400 of these vessels? We don't know what exactly they were. Obviously, there would have been cups that you could drink out of. Uh, they may have been the utensils used, for, uh, used in the temple, the snuff dishes, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the vessels. There were particular vessels for making the bread, the showbread uh, that was on the table of showbread. Maybe that was part of that as well. Um, and now these people had an opportunity to return these vessels to the temple, to the rightful place. Of course, the temple is not built yet. But when the temple did get built, then all these utensils would be ready to be there in their rightful place. And really to restore <clears throat> God's honor in the sight of the heathen. And so sometimes things go wrong. Um, they may go wrong uh, in your life. They may go wrong in in our country, they might go wrong in church, uh, they might go wrong in relationships. But if there's an opportunity that God sets before us to undo that wrong, to undo the harm, to restore that which is broken, to heal that which has been hurt, uh, we should take those opportunities. And that's exactly what these people d- did. Uh, God was going to use them to right the wrong. And that's always a good thing when that can happen. Sometimes wrongs can't be righted. Sometimes it's hard to unscramble the egg it's impossible to unscramble the egg but if there's an opportunity for us to right the wrong then we should we should take that opportunity then in chapter two we have this long list um, of the people who go back so their number here in verses one through verse 67 and it starts off with this register of those who return some by family so from verse three down to verse 19 uh, talks about the children of Hashem, two, uh, 223. So he lists the families here. These are, th- these are family names from verse 3 to verse 19. And then verse 20, he begins a different way of registering. It was not families' names, but c- city names, town names, village names. Uh, so in verse 20, the children of Gabar, that would have been a village, that would have been a town, 195. The children of Bethlehem, 123. So 123, and out of that 123 would have come really the lineage of David and the lineage of uh, both Joseph and Mary, of whom Jesus would be born um, in Bethlehem. That would, that's where they belong to, Bethlehem. So out of that 123, the lineage of Christ would come. Uh, special emphasis is given to the priests and Levites as well as to the singers. Look at verse 41. It says, um, and, why, and why, why would it be important for... Uh, the priests and the Levites to be mentioned specially here? Well, because what are they going back for? It's the temple. So it's not just the building. 
it's they weren't just going to go back to have the building. In fact, when they first got back, they didn't even build the building. But they did offer sacrifices, and it was a sacrificial system. Well, who offers the sacrifice? The, the sacrifices, the Levites, the priests, um, and then part of their worship was there was dedicated people who sang and who worshipped. And so in verse 41, he says, the singers, the children of Asaph, um, and 120 and 8. You have the porters mentioned in verse 42, verse 43, the Nethams. Uh, if you look over uh, the, the, the servants of Solomon, verse 58, all the Nethams and the children of Solomon's servants were 392. So Solomon's servants who stood and listened to Solomon, uh, some of that wisdom, I'm sure, rubbed off on them, would you not? Would you not, would you not like to sit down and have a couple of hour conversation with a servant who was present uh, under uh, Solomon's reign. Would you? I mean, I love it. What What was some of the things Solomon told you? What was the most impressive thing you heard Solomon say? Would that be another? Well, it'd be fantastic to be able to answer ask some of those questions. Well, some of that came down through the generations, and so here you have the children of the servants of Solomon, and so very very interesting uh, people, I'm sure. But they would have known all about the temple. They would have known about all how things were done in the temple. And so it was really uh, an important group of people. He also mentions there in verse uh, b- 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 verse 65, talks about the, the servants and the maids. And then it says, and there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. So it wasn't just the men that sang. There was 200 singing men and singing women. Now, what would, what would make you a singing man or a singing woman? What would... What would uh, what would qualify you as a singing man or singing woman? What do you think? You think the singing men and the singing women were choos- chosen out of people who couldn't uh, carry a tune in a bucket? You know, they're, when they sang, they were off key all the time. Do you think that's why they were chosen? You think these people actually had a talent to sing? I think they did. Um, and like I say, everybody has his place, you know. And so, and they obviously were not all. People that sing in this church, we're not all, you know, professional singers or whatever. Uh, we do the best that we can, right? Um, but, you know, if, if I couldn't sing a note in a bucket, or carry a tune in a bucket, maybe I should say, um, I mean, I probably, you'd, you'd have to drag me up here, you know? But, I mean, uh, so I'm just saying that, uh, you know, we should volunteer for the things that we're, you know, gifted to do, apt to do. And um, I think that's what glorifies God. The most when we're doing what we've been cut out to do, designed by God to do. So uh, these would be of great importance in rebuilding and re- reusing the temple. And in verse 64, the congregation totaled 42,360 with an additional 7,337 servants and maids. And the total would be 49,697. So around 50,000 people that came back in the return. Look at verse uh, 68 and 69 of chapter 2. It says, when they came into the land, and some of the chief of the fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set it up in his place. And they gave after their ability unto the treasure of the work three score and one thousand drams of gold and five thousand pound of silver and one hundred priest garments. So here, this is a, a special offering that people who had returned to the land were now giving. Now, that that wasn't all of them. Verse 68 says, And some of the chief of the fathers, verse 69, they gave after their ability. Some people didn't have to give. You see, maybe somebody could sing, but they they didn't have the money to give. But somebody maybe couldn't sing, and they did have the money to give. See what I'm saying? It's It's a group effort here. It's a team effort. And everybody got involved and did what they could. Now, what you see here is really this free will offering to build a temple, it was according to their ability. And this really describes for us uh, the alms gift. And there's three types of giving that I've found in Scripture. There's worship giving, which is tithing. It belongs to the Lord. And so you're basically giving to God what really belongs to him. Of all that I give us, may I will surely give the tenth unto thee, Jacob said. And it's really acknowledging who God is. And that's part of worship. And really those who acknowledge God in their lives, doesn't matter who they are, what their background is, if they acknowledge that God has provided, then a, a tangible way of acknowledging that, worshipping God, was giving back one-tenth to him. 
And so that's worship giving. That's what tithing is supposed to be. Uh, the second kind of giving is alms giving. That's benevolent giving. And the key features with alms giving is you see it, your heart is touched, and then you choose to do something about it with what you have. Okay? So it was given in response to seeing something, being touched in your heart, then giving what you have. They came to Jerusalem. They saw where the temple would have been. It's not there now. And their heart is just touched. Their heart's touched. Now, obviously, God had put this in their heart already. But when they saw, they came and they saw what was happening, they said, we've, we've, got, to, we've got to do something. And their, their heart was touched. And they offered freely for the house of God. It wasn't required. It wasn't uh, something that the, you know, they were constrained to do. It was something that they thought about in their own hearts when they saw the name. And they gave after their ability to the treasure of the work. So they had it. So that's the second kind of giving. There's a third kind of giving, which is kind of like almsgiving, in that we see the need, we're touched by that need, and we want to give, but we can't afford to give. But we give anyway. And that's faith giving. That's grace giving. That's God's ability to give. In other words, what we're doing is we're creating a need in our life in order to take care of somebody else's need and trusting God to meet our need. Like the widow woman of Zarephath. When Elijah came, he said, make me a little cake first. She didn't have enough. So she's going to create a need to, to take care of Elijah's need. And she did it anyway. And because of that, God provided the barrel of wheel, meal, waste it not, the cruise of oil, feel not, for the whole time of the famine. Uh, the widow woman that Jesus was watching, she came and she put her two mates in the box. She couldn't afford to do that. That was faith giving. She was creating a need. She could have taken those two farthings and bought herself breakfast the next morning. But she took what she needed and she gave it away, trusting God to meet her need. Now, the Bible doesn't say, but I have a pretty good idea that God met her need. The old boy with the five loaves, two barley, uh, uh, five barley loaves, two small fishes, he created a need. and Hey, that was his lunch. What's he going to eat? And he gave it away, created a need in his own life. Um, so he gave it by faith. Did he eat that day? Yeah, along with the 5,000 others, and probably more than uh, he would have eaten in, in his own lunch. So that third kind of giving is, is giving that you can't afford. But the middle, the second type of giving is almsgiving, which is giving what you can't, aff what you can't afford. In other words, you have it. And it doesn't have to be money. Maybe you see somebody uh, that needs something, and you have it sitting there. You're not even using it. And the Lord touches your heart. Maybe... In, Maybe you wouldn't ordinarily think about it, but something about this situation where it stands out and you see the person with need and all of a sudden, I could, I could meet that. I've got one of those. And the Lord touches your heart and then you take what you have and you give it to that person. That's almsgiving. Okay? Now, <clears throat> we'll be talking about that tonight, by the way, um, partly. What do you do with somebody um, who is basically trying to... Uh, panhandle you. He's trying, you know, he's, he's trying to make money off of you. He's trying to take advantage of you. And um, well, you should be wise enough to see that for what it is. And uh, is your heart touched? No. Because you see that when you see when you see it's a genuine need, there's something that happens in here. When you see somebody's just out to try to make something off you, and he's taking advantage of people, then you say no. He needs to get himself a job or whatever it might be. All right, but they gave, and they gave to the house of the Lord after their ability to the treasure. And then the last thing, their home sweet home, verse 2, sorry, chapter 20, chapter 2, verse 70. So the priests and the Levites and some of the people and the singers and the porters and the Nethams dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. Now that's interesting. When they first go back, they don't immediately start to build the temple. Now that's why they're there. Uh, but you'll see if you go over to verse 8, it says, of chapter 3, it says, Now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, so this is probably like about 14, 14 months into this, began Zerubbabel the son of uh, Shealtiel uh, and Joshua the son of uh, Judah Zadak, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from twenty years old and upward, 
to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. So this basically, they allowed them to go back and, and you know, settle their families. They had their wives and their children with them. And so, by the way, your family should come first in those things. And so they had to get those settled. But once they were settled, then Zerubbabel, the leader, basically says, right, guys, come on, 20 years old and upward, we've got to get this work started. And so that's when they began to build and lay the foundation of the temple, which is what we'll come to in our next study. But here we have a great, great, great journey that begins here in Ezra chapter 1 and 2. And thank God for these ones who were willing to go to step out by faith, who had that uh, purpose for to glorify God, that his house would be glorified, that his reproach would be removed, to be able to right the wrong that had happened under Nebuchadnezzar. And they gave themselves and they gave what they had in order to make this happen. So they were really uh, heart and soul involved with this great movement to go back. And the Lord certainly did use them. Was it going to be easy for them? Is it going to be no opposition? We're going to find out in a couple of lessons from now that they had all kinds of opposition. In fact, there was so great opposition that the work stopped. And you see what happens then, what God does, and how the thing gets resolved. There's a lot of, thing, <clears throat> a lot of really interesting principles and interesting information that we're going to get <clears throat> in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. And really applies to our lives too. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We're grateful for the beginning of this study. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will open our eyes to this often neglected part of the Bible, the back of the book, and Lord, that you'll help us to understand what happened, why it happened, and how it affects us, and the principles that we can learn that will encourage us uh, to do the right thing, though it might be difficult, and then, Lord, to work through the opposition we find in our life, and that, Lord, to realize that there is hope after uh, failure, and, Lord, there's uh, always a way forward, and that's what they were going through at that time. Help us to learn those lessons, and may your word be precious to us, Lord. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.